Uh, next up, we have Dr. Jeff Lovely. Um, Jeff, do you want to share your screen? Good morning. My name is Jeffrey Lovely, and today I'm going to tell you a story about a lymphocyte genome editor called the RAG recombinase that's responsible for assembling these important Y-shaped molecules called antibodies that protect us all from disease. And RAG initiates the assembly of antibody genes at the IGH locus and pro-B lymphocytes of the adaptive immune system. And so your immune system is always at war. And so you can think of your skin or your epithelium as Atlantic wall. And once invaders breach that wall, your first line of defense are innate immune cells. And they do battle. But then they can call in the help of specialized cells called lymphocytes that carry the heavy artillery of the immune system, which are your antibodies. And so antibodies are the heavy artillery of the immune system, and they're made in lymphocytes. And one of the things we know about antibodies is they're very diverse. So we have on the order of trillions of unique antibodies, which are proteins. But we also know we only have about 20,000 protein encoding genes. And so the generation of antibodies presents a paradox in how we think about how proteins are created from genes. And so researchers began studying the polypeptide chains of antibodies to get a clue as to how this diversity was generated. And antibodies composed of a light chain and a heavy chain. And the researchers found that one end of the light or heavy chain was conserved, while the other end of the light or heavy chain was variable. And this indicated to researchers that some sort of shuffling event must have occurred to generate this diversity of antibodies. But it was unclear if it was the DNA, RNA, or protein that was being shuffled around. And so the first researchers to propose mm -hmm. that it was in fact DNA that was being shuffled around was William J. Dreyer and John Claude Bennett. And they provide a solution to the paradox quite beautifully. They say it appears therefore that immunologically competent cells have evolved a pattern of somatic genetic behavior, which is radically different from anything normally found in modern molecular genetics. And so that radical genetic behavior that Dreyer and Bennett were alluding to is called RAG mediated VDJ recombination. And it's the solution to the paradox. And so VDJ recombination is required for B cell development. And it begins with rearrangement of the IGH locus, which encodes for the heavy chain of antibody molecules. And so initially in pro B lymphocytes, the IGH locus has a V for variable, a D for diversity, a J for joining, and a C for constant antibody gene segments. And initially, these gene segments have DNA in between them. So they're disassembled. And what the RAG recombinase does is it first comes along to this D and J gene segment, and it cuts out the DNA in between. And then the D and J genes are joined. And then RAG comes along again and cuts out the DNA in between this V and DJ gene segment, thereby assembling a B, D, and J gene. And this is how you get a heavy chain that's variable on one end and conserved on the other end because the constant region just goes along for the ride. And so this change in the locus through lymphocyte development is what Susumi Tanagawa was awarded his Nobel Prize for. And so I told you the main actor removing the DNA in between these gene segments is the RAG recombinase. But how does RAG actually go about removing the DNA, for example, between this D and J gene segment? Well, if we zoom in on this D and J gene segment prior to rearrangement, what we find is adjacent to the gene segments are sites called recombination signal sequences, which are represented here as triangles. And they come in two flavors, a 12 RSS and a 23 RSS. And once RAG comes in contact with these RSS sites, RAG first binds to the 23 RSS adjacent to the J gene segment, and then RAG swings over and captures the 12 RSS thereby introducing a loop in the DNA molecule. And that state's called the paired complex. Then RAG introduces DNA breaks, thereby removing the intervening DNA. And then DNA repair factors glue the gene segments together. And now up until this year, we thought the vast majority of antibody genes were assembled by RAG alone, in which it captures a 12 RSS. And while I was a PhD student working with Rob Phillips and David Baltimore, I thought this picture was nice, but I wanted to biochemically validate this mechanism in vitro or outside of the cell. And I showed that RAG can indeed capture RSSs outside of the cell. But we now know as of 2020 that in vivo or inside the cell, RAG alone can only assemble a very small fraction of antibody genes. And that's because RAG has a DNA length dependence problem. 
It can't capture RSSs that are far away. It needs help from another factor. And that factor is called cohesin. And cohesin, which is shown here in red, forms a ring and it binds adjacent to RAG, which is bound to the 23 RSS. And what cohesin can do is extrude DNA bidirectionally, resulting in the formation of a small loop. But now cohesin has run into RAG, which is bound to the 23 RSS. And so the DNA to the right of RAG can no longer be extruded by cohesin because RAG is blocking it. But the DNA to the left of RAG that has the 12 RSS that RAG wants to get to, cohesin can keep extruding. And so cohesin can bring this 12 RSS closer and closer and closer to RAG until RAG captures it and then carries out those same steps of the reaction. And so this is how we think the vast majority of antibody genes are assembled. And the central assumption of this model is that RAG occupies the IGH locus at a high probability while preventing cohesion extrusion of the DNA to the right or downstream of RAG bound next to the J gene segment. However, this model was built using data that did not directly observe RAG at the IGH locus. And so the problem I posed for my postdoc was to directly observe RAG at the IGH locus so we could determine its probability of occupying the locus in real time. And so to illuminate RAG in the IGH locus in living pro B lymphocytes, I put a light bulb on RAG and I put a different light bulb on the IGH locus. And for the aficionados in the room, the light bulb I put on RAG is a halo tag that can covalently couple to cell permeable fluorophores. And the light bulb I put on the IGH locus was the introduction of TET operator sites in the introduction of a TET repressor protein fused to a fluorescent protein, which allowed for me to illuminate the locus. And to image RAG in the IGH locus, I used a recent advance in microscopy called HELO imaging, which is optimal for imaging single molecules in the intracellular compartment of living cells. And so HELO imaging permitted us to visualize RAG, which is shown in red, in the IGH locus, which is shown in blue and located within this white box. And so we can track RAG in the IGH locus simultaneously, and we can ask the question, are there times once RAG and the IGH locus co-localize or kiss? Because this would suggest that RAG is bound to the IGH locus. And so on the right-hand side in this top panel labeled IGH locus, within this yellow box, there's a signal and that's IGH. And in the same exact position, we observe a RAG signal. So RAG does indeed co-localize with the IGH locus. And so we can use this data to determine RAG's probability of binding to the IGH locus. And so to determine RAG's probability of binding to the IGH locus, we just take the time that RAG spins bound to the IGH locus, and we divide it by the total time that the IGH locus is bound and unbound. And so if the probability of binding is less than 0.5, then the IGH locus is unbound most of the time. But if the probability of binding is greater than 0.5, then the IGH locus is bound most of the time. And so we find the probability of RAG binding to the IGH locus is really low, it's about 0.02. And so this means the IGH locus is unbound most of the time. And so since RAG is rarely at the scene of the crime, the IGH locus, we think the central assumption of the model that RAG occupies the IGH locus at a high probability and is preventing downstream extrusion is incorrect. And so in the immediate future, we have to figure out what is preventing downstream extrusion at the IGH locus, since we no longer think it is RAG, since it is rarely ever there. And we must now construct models of antibody gene assembly that require sporadic RAG occupancy, since a high RAG occupancy model is not supported by our data. And so I hope I've shown you today that when you view a biological process in real time, you can find surprises and challenge assumptions made by cartoon models in biology. And my long-term future goal is to provide a deep mechanistic understanding of antibody gene assembly to determine if we can engineer antibodies by learning the rules to bias their assembly. And so I'd like to acknowledge the important people, the Next Generation Faculty Symposium, and to the audience, thank you for your time.